Okay, great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, let's do a quick test here. Can everybody hear me? Give me a check or an X. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, it is my honor to introduce our speaker this week. Um, we have Dr. Katherine Hayhoe, and she's a research associate professor of atmospheric sciences at Texas Tech. And her expertise is in climate change issues um, related to modeling and regional climate impacts. Um, and she's actually served uh, as an expert reviewer on the um, IPCC. Uh, and today she's going to be talking to us about climate projections, where do they come from, and what can we use them for. So with that, let's welcome Catherine. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> Maybe I could ask for text to make sure everybody can hear me too. Yes, one person can. Anybody else hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> At least a few of you can. All right. Here we go. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of the big picture of we start with these um, projections at the global scale, like the map you see in the top corner. But those projections aren't really useful if what you're really interested in is what's going on at the local scale where we, where we live, where we experience the impacts. So how do we get from that big scale to the smaller scale? First of all, let's just start with an overview of the problem. We all know what the problem is, but it's helpful just to kind of put it in perspective when we're beginning to talk about this problem. Uh, we produce an enormous amount of heat trapping or greenhouse gases. If you look at the U.S., about a third comes from electric power industry, just under a third comes from transportation, and the rest comes from various um, industry, agriculture, and then heating and cooling our homes and our buildings. So why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because these gases are building up in the atmosphere. We have a pretty good record of how much coal and gas and oil we've burned since the Industrial Revolution because we had to pay money for it. And anything you pay for, you have a good record of. And so, as you can see, we've been burning increasing amounts of these fossil fuels over time, and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, as indicated by the black line, has been going up. Not as much as it would if the ocean and the biosphere hadn't been helping us out. A lot of the carbon dioxide is going there, but there's still quite enough to keep building up in the atmosphere, which is causing our climate to change. If you look at the history of the Earth's temperature, you see that it goes up and down from year to year. Um, that's weather. but if you look at long periods of time, climate timescales, which are the averages of at least 30 years or more, we see a very steady increase in the Earth's temperature to the point where the 2000s was the warmest decade on record, uh, 2010 was the wettest year on record, and also tied as the warmest year. And then 2011 actually set a record that you may have heard about recently. It was the warmest La Nina year on record. Usually La Nina years are quite cool, compared to the global average. And this was the warmest La Nina record or year that we ever had. <clears throat> so if we look back in time, um, this is looking back over the past uh, thousand years here, we see that our warming is relatively unusual in the history of uh, Western civilization, but we're already concerned about the impacts of this warming. Uh, impacts that we've seen so far um, include major shifts in our crops, expansion of invasive species like kudzu, um, kudzu, you think, might be um, <clears throat> native only to the southeast, but it's firmly established in southern Illinois, which is well into the Midwest by now. And just two years ago, they found the first instances of kudzu actually over the border in Canada, where it was on private land and it couldn't be removed because nobody ever thought it would make it to Canada, and therefore it wasn't on the invasive species list of, of species the government could step in and remove. So <clears throat> we've got these invasive species spreading. We've got major shifts in our crops and our forests. We've got declining glaciers. This is a picture of one of the remaining glaciers in Glacier National Park. I think they're still calling this one a glacier, even though it very soon won't be. And then we also have some interesting studies that have attributed crop losses and droughts over the past 30 years to climate change as well. So this is what we've already seen happening in our world. But this is what could be coming next. Um, this looks pretty scary, uh, so what we're going to do with the rest of this presentation is we're going to break it out, uh, figure out where this information comes from and how certain we can be about it. But and this is the general range of what we expect over the next century. 
And even if we could flip some magic switch and turn everything off today, we would still be looking at the lower end of that range, which is about twice as much as what we've already seen from the Industrial Revolution until today. So this is the problem that we're facing. Well, so how do we predict an uncertain future? Well, the first way we do it is we don't actually predict it. Um, instead, what we do is we develop projections. Now, this may seem like a bit of a nuance to you, but there is an important difference between those two words. Predicting implies certainty, like predicting the weather. You know, there's a 50% chance of rain or an 80% chance of rain. Whereas with projecting, we can't really assign any certainties. We can just say, this is what would happen under certain assumptions. And I'm going to talk about these assumptions here so that we understand what it is that makes these projections. So why are future projections uncertain? There's four main reasons here. Um, the first one is simply because we have ongoing natural variations in climate that are chaotic, making it difficult to predict our conditions over time scales shorter than a decade. This is natural. In fact, it's what, often what we think of as weather. Um, chaos simply means that conditions are very dependent on what happens at the beginning, um, and that's certainly the case with the weather. And it's the case with variations over about 10 years or so. So our future predictions, especially over 10 years, are uncertain because of natural causes. They're also uncertain because of scientific causes, and that's the next two items here. First of all, we don't know, and we will never know until it's already happened, exactly how sensitive the climate system is to what we're putting into the atmosphere. We can certainly look at how sensitive it was in the past, but how sensitive it is today depends on the initial conditions, which have never exactly precisely occurred before. So this is something we are really never going to know until it happens, but we can guess. We can certainly formulate the best guess of how sensitive it is. And then number three is we don't know enough about the climate system. Our ability to simulate the climate system is limited and incomplete. We're very aware of that as scientists, that we don't know everything there is to know about the Earth. So these are scientific uncertainties. And then there's one last uncertainty down at the bottom here, which is that we don't know what future emissions from human activities will be. If we could predict human behavior, we'd be off making a ton of money on the stock market and hopefully using that to pay our graduate students. Um, but we don't know that. And so the best we can do is to develop a range of projections of things that we possibly, plausibly might do in the future. So this is the human source of uncertainty. So let's break these down by the time scales over which they're important. The natural factors, the scientific factors, and the human factors. If we're looking at about 10 years, and we're looking at temperature here, You've got three figures here. One is the percentage of uncertainty going out 10 years that's due to natural variability. The middle one is the percent of uncertainty that's due to scientific uncertainty. And then the last one is the percent of variability that's due to human uncertainty, which is almost nothing. Because most of the change we're going to see over the next 10 years is because of what we've already put into the atmosphere. It's not because of what we're going to. The climate's still responding. It's kind of like, your body is still responding to all the poor, <laughs> poor eating choices you made over the past 10 years. It's not the, the hamburger that you ate yesterday that's necessarily um, impacting your circulation. It's what you ate over the last 10 years that's having its effect today. So over the, for, over the next 10 years, um, natural causes are the most important causes of uncertainty. What if we go at about 40 years? Well, then the picture shifts. It shifts so that now, scientific uncertainty is the most important. So if you're going to focus on the middle, you know, middle of the century, 40 years or so from now, then this is the uncertainty you really want to concentrate on. But what if you're interested in longer term? Well, then the primary source of uncertainty for most of the world is now human choices. What are the choices we're going to make that affect the amount of heat trapping gases we're putting into the atmosphere, the amount of CO2, that affect the amount of climate change? That's the most important. Now, what I showed you just here is for temperature. So let's just show you the same figure, but for precipitation instead. It's very different. 
let me go back again. See, there's temperature and precipitation. For some places in Africa and India, not exactly the places you'd probably pick, uh, natural variability is still important. For many places, scientific uncertainty is the most important, and only for a few parts of the world is human uncertainty the most important source of uncertainty. So it depends on the variable you're looking at, as well as the time scale, which source of uncertainty is more important. So let's break these down one by one. Why are future projections uncertain? First of all, because of natural causes. This is the same reason that we looked at before. So what can we do about it? Over the near term, natural variability is the greatest source of uncertainty projections. Global mean temperature is likely to increase between about half to one degree Celsius over that time. So the recommendation is to use multiple future simulations that could come from the same climate model or from different models. Because all you want to do is you want to make sure you cover a range of likely natural variability over that time to calculate, you know, what's the risk of a drought happening in the next 10 to 20 years? What's the risk of a certain type of heat wave? Use as many different simulations as you can because each of those will have slightly different initial conditions and slightly different patterns of natural variability. One might have a La Nina in 2018. The other one might have a La Nina in 2016. They'll all have the same patterns of natural variability, but the timing will be a little bit different. So <clears throat> let's look at the scientific uncertainty now. We dealt with natural uncertainty pretty quickly. Um, and the best thing to do, I should say, with natural uncertainty is to average over a 20 to 30 year period. Because again, these are climate projections, they're not weather predict predictions. So with climate projections, if you average over 20 or 30 years, so for example, if you look at the change expected between 2030 and 2050, then you're averaging across a lot of this natural variability, so you don't really have to worry about it as much because it's not important at longer time scales. So scientific uncertainty. We have these two different reasons why future projections are uncertain because of issues related to the science. And the first one is because we don't know exactly how sensitive the climate system is to these emissions. It's kind of like when the doctor first gives you a certain type of medicine, he has to often adjust the dose because he doesn't know exactly how your body is going to respond to the medicine compared to everybody else's. So in the same way, we're not exactly sure how our planet is going to respond to what we're putting into the atmosphere, and then we have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. You know, when the doctor gives you the medicine, he knows what the medicine's going to do. He just isn't exactly sure what dose is going to accomplish what he wants. So in the same way, we know what putting massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere is going to do, but we just aren't sure exactly how strong the response of the climate system is going to be. So we actually have this, this um, metric that we've defined kind of arbitrarily um, as the long-term change in global mean temperature uh, that occurs as a result of doubling carbon dioxide levels compared to pre-industrial times. This is very human-centric. You know, why pick pre-industrial times? Well, that's just because when we started to increase climate or uh, CO2 emissions. Um, the sensitivity includes short-term responses of water vapor and clouds and sea ice and snow cover and the surface of the ocean to warming planet, but it doesn't include the response of the deep ocean because that takes hundreds of years. So what is climate sensitivity? Well, we can actually get a distribution of likely values using a lot of historical observations, a lot of paleoclimate uh, records that go back thousands and even millions of years. We can do a lot of climate modeling, um, and we can even ask people what their opinion is, uh, people who've studied this all their lives. And when you add up all the different lines of evidence, and there's about five different lines of evidence to try to figure out what this value is, we see that it's a distribution that is not normal. It's kind of skewed towards the wrong end, in my opinion, because we don't want it to be skewed towards that end. Um, our average value, most likely value is about three. So the planet would increase by three degrees Celsius if we doubled CO2. Um, the likely range is green from two to five. The very likely range is yellow from about 1.6 up to 10 degrees Celsius. So in other words, we are very sure it lies within the yellow range. We're pretty sure it lies within the green range. And if you had to pin somebody down, their best guess would be that it's three degrees. 
Um, but just for perspective here, our global climate models cover this range. So in other words, any climate model projections that you ever use are going to be on the conservative side with respect to what the science tells us about climate sensitivity. So even the most sensitive climate model we have doesn't even go to the top of the green range. And that's just, there's nothing we can really do about that because climate models develop their own sensitivity. They're not assigned yeah, arbitrarily. But um, it's just a perspective for us to remember when we're using this information that even the most sensitive model is uh, relatively conservative. So our, our um, second scientific issue, uncertainty number three, is how well do we actually reproduce what's going on in the atmosphere? Well, just a reminder that GCM, which conveniently stands for Global Climate Model, used to originally stand for General Circulation Model, because these were physics-based models that used the fundamental equations of nonlinear fluid dynamics to try to simulate the actual circulation of fluid on a rotating sphere. That was the actual physical problem that um, these models were invented to solve. So they actually do a really good job at this because this is, you know, pure physics. But nowadays they're a lot more complicated. Um, they divide the Earth and the atmosphere and the ocean up into smaller and smaller grid cells. Today, um, global models are being run at 25 kilometer resolution, so each grid cell is 25 by 25 kilometers, which is pretty small. It's good enough to, to um, develop some pretty nice looking hurricanes. I just saw some recent simulations. Um, and these models have progressed far beyond physics. I mean, now they have chemistry, they have biology, um, they have ecosystems and clouds and sea ice and obviously the human impact also. So how well do these models actually do? Um, and here's an example that matters to the southeast. Uh, for example, do the models reproduce uh, El Nino? El Nino is a warm current of ocean water that recurs off the coast of Peru. This is what it looks like in real life. Um, you can see that there's a positive, let's see here, let's use the fancy tools, there we go. There's a positive um, temperature anomaly, or a warm temperature, I should say, off here. And then there is, let's see if I can use this, here we go. Then there's this cool kind of horseshoe on either side. So let's actually ask the climate models, well, can you reproduce El Nino? And this is exactly the question we asked them. Up on the top, in the black box, you have um, two different observational or near observational data sets. And then all the rest here are the climate models. And so you can see that all the climate models do produce something that looks like El Nino, but some of them are too weak. For example, this one here, some of them are too weak, and some of them are too strong, like this one here. Well, what we really care about is not necessarily what's going on in the Pacific. What we actually care about is what's going on over the southeast, for example. So let's look at this. If we look at Florida specifically, and I haven't done this analysis for the southeast, unfortunately, just for Florida. I'm going to have to stick with that. Um, you see that there is a positive correlation between, in the observations, between precipitation and El Nino. So in other words, when you have El Nino, you get more winter precipitation than you would otherwise. Now, all of the climate models capture this positive correlation. They're all positive. So that's a good thing. So they've got the circulation uh, patterns correct that connect what's going on with El Nino to what's going on over Florida. But as you can see, they're very, very different numbers. So a lot of them are way too high. Some of them are way too low. If we actually look at the pattern, this is here is the observed pattern of the positive correlation. Red is positive and blue is negative. So red is a positive correlation between El Nino and precipitation in the winter over the southeast. And you can see that this model actually does a pretty good job of capturing that pattern. I think the pattern maybe looks more like this. There we go, this pattern here. But this model here doesn't capture the pattern at all. Even though it gets the sign right, it's almost accidental. So these are the types of ways that we can evaluate these climate models. But it's really important to only evaluate the models of what they're supposed to be able to do. So before you get reading this long list, let me just tell you what I mean by that. What I mean is, um, the model isn't supposed to reproduce the average temperature of spring in Raleigh. Um, it's not supposed to do that. 
It's not supposed to reproduce the difference between Raleigh and Asheville or between Asheville and Wilmington. Um, it's not even supposed to reproduce the annual cycle of a given small location. These models are only supposed to be accurate over um, the scale of maybe the entire southeast or more. And they're not necessarily supposed to reproduce the exact precise value, but more the change in the climate dynamics that are going on over the larger area. So what I've done um, for a guidebook that's coming out that's going to be produced by the Fish and Wildlife Service this spring is I've actually gone through the literature and so that you don't have to do the comparison yourself, I've taken all the different climate models, which are these ones here, all the different climate models here, and I've gone through the literature, I've looked at all the journal articles, and I've said, what different ways were these models evaluated? Um, and let's see, the, the X means that they did poorly. So for example here, this is a poor. Uh, the check means that they did well. And uh, the circle means they did okay. And then this just means that they weren't evaluated. So looking down this, this is for the Arctic, and the performance is very different depending on location. Um, I do have one for the continental US too. You can see that, for example, let's see, this model is, has a lot of circles and check marks. Um, this model has mostly X's. So there are ways to kind of get rid of some models that are kind of turkeys, you might say, that not being a technical term. <laughs> but in general, you shouldn't be evaluating the global models yourself because you're not going to be asking them the right questions and any results you get are going to be kind of arbitrary. So um, let me stop here and actually ask if anybody has any questions because what I just talked about is kind of technical and kind of detailed and everybody always thinks, oh, well, let me evaluate the model to see if it makes sense. But what I'm trying to say is no, not all models are equal, but it's not really helpful to determine if they give you the right temperature or precipitation for a certain point location because they're not supposed to do that. Um, so does anybody have any questions? I don't see any hands going up. Um, if you want to ask a question, it's the little hand with the green arrow on top on the far left, just under your name. OK. If there's no questions, then I will keep going. So oh, here's a question. Great. Um, what's the standard? OK. This is a good question. Maggie asks, what's the standard for determining a model is OK or good? Um, as I'm, as I'm going to say here, I'm, I think on the last bullet point. It's not a matter of picking the best climate models to use. We should try to use as many climate models as we can. We just should call the really bad ones. And the really bad, bad ones are ones that don't reproduce key features of um, the atmosphere of the ocean. Like if they don't have a jet stream or they don't have an El Nino um, that's any good or they don't, um, let's see, uh, in the Caribbean, for example, they don't reproduce the, the um, annual cycle of precipitation that, with, a, with a double hump. Like, if they don't reproduce a large-scale feature, um, that's important. So I think the jet stream is probably a good example. Then you would get rid of them. But as you can see on this slide, only get rid of models if you can show that they don't reproduce large-scale circulation. Other than that, the best thing to do, and there's a lot of studies showing this, is to use um, as many models as you can. Because some of them are good at some things, some are good at other things, and by using a lot of them, you're going to kind of get a lot of the bumps and wiggles out of it, and the, the average of multiple models is nearly always more accurate than a single model, even the best model, if you could hypothetically identify that. Um, and interestingly, for the continental US, there haven't been any studies that have been able to show that culling models helps make a difference. Um, in Alaska, it does, because in Alaska, there's some models that don't pick up the sea ice um, and how that affects regional climate. So in Alaska, it is important to call these models. But for the U continental US, I don't know any published paper yet that has shown that culling models actually helps. So that's a little reassuring in that you, know, you can't really make too big a mistake if you just use as many models as you can. So the recommendation here for mid-century is to use as many models as you can. Um, from different climate models here, make sure they're different climate models, to cover an adequate range of climate sensitivity and uncertainty. Um, now, number four, uncertainty due to human choices. We don't know what future emissions from human activities are going to be. Um, 
Now this slide's a little confusing because it was supposed to be animated. And I forgot to take the animations out. Um, what we're looking at here, let me explain. What we're looking at here with all these different colored lines on the graph is different possible pathways of greenhouse gas emissions in the future. We could continue to depend on fossil fuels as our primary resource. We could transition to renewable energy sources, like the lower ones do. Or we could end up, you know, somewhere in between. So as scientists, what we usually do as scientists is we usually say, oh, well, let's fit a normal distribution to this uncertainty, which I'm highlighting here. And the reality is probably in the middle, right? Because as, as, a, um, as physical scientists, a lot of physical uncertainties are normally distributed. And the best guess lies in the middle of the distribution. So that is what way too many people have done. In fact, you can find this all over the literature where people have said, oh, let's take a mid-range scenario. Let's take these, one of these two scenarios right here, because they're clearly the best guess. I would say that's not true at all. I would say there's an equally good, if not better, case for saying either we're going to do something about climate change, right, or we're not, or sorry, either we are, are not or we are. So if we do do something about climate change, we're going to end up down here. If we don't do something about climate change, we're going to end up out here. And being in the middle is actually the least likely option um, because it's kind of, you know, a little bit like, yes, we are, no, we aren't. You know, either we are or we aren't. Um, and then you get what the IPCC says, which I think is perfectly accurate, which is they say you can't actually assign any likelihood at all to these scenarios because we can't predict what people are going to do. And actually, in fact, if we weren't studying climate change at all, if we weren't studying these impacts at all, it would be nearly 100% chance we'd end up up here, right? But every time we study the impacts of climate change and we discover that some of them are unacceptable, we provide a little bit of motivation to move, let's switch my thing, to move this box down a little bit. So every time we study the impacts of climate change, we're actually dynamically affecting the likelihood moving this down a little, 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 little bit. And maybe, maybe eventually one day, the weight of evidence will accumulate to where all of a sudden this will just go like that. And this will become the most likely scenario. Who knows? But this is just a perspective to remember that this, if you pick, here we go, if you pick these scenarios based on a normal distribution, um, you might actually be wrong, very wrong. Because that's really not the way humans behave. Well, so anybody who has sharp eyes probably noticed that these scenarios begin in 2000, and here we are in 2011. So um, how are we doing? We've had, oh, aren't we already tracing on the A2 scenario? Um, well, that's where I'm going next, so just hang on a sec, Mark. Uh, we've already had 11 years to figure out where we're at, so let's take a look. Um, and by the way, um, A2 is the orange one. Uh, A1FI is the higher one. That's the brown one here. This is A1FI here. Okay, so here we have all of our different scenarios, um, and let's see. Uh, this one is A1FI, this one is A2, and this one is A1B. It actually goes down sub sub substantially after this. So if you take this one out, oops, take this one out, it actually goes down, whereas these ones go up like this. Um, so if you look at where we are, uh, during the 1990s, our emissions grew at about 1% per year. During the 2000s, our emissions grew at about 3% per year globally. So right now, we're still within the range of these scenarios, but it's pretty clear that if we continue on our current trajectory, um, we are heading above even the highest emissions. Let's see. Uh, sorry, Eric. <laughs> I will try to keep the doodling to a minimum. So, so we're still within this range, but we are heading above the range if we continue on our current pathway. Uh, one way we might possibly constrain it is by looking at how much we have left, um, how much oil and coal and gas we have left. Um, but unfortunately here, the news is not really good because uh, we have more than enough coal to exceed any of the scenarios we're looking at. Um, so just as uh, somebody once said, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone. 
And unfortunately, it doesn't look like the fossil fuel age is going to end because we've run out of fossil fuels, sadly. So what do these different scenarios look like over time? Well, over the near term, there's really no difference between the two scenarios. Here we're looking at the highest and the lowest one. There's really no difference because the change over the next couple of decades is because of what we've already put into the atmosphere. Um, like I said, you know, the, the health impacts your body is experiencing is not because of the hamburger you ate yesterday. It's because of all your diet and lifestyle choices over the last 10, 20 years. But by the time we get up to the middle of the century and then the end of the century, we start to see a big difference between the temperature change expected under higher versus lower emissions. But here's the key. By the time we get out here, it's too late to pick which pathway we want to be on. So the reason why we do this is to say, look, here are the implications of our choices. And literally, at this point in time, we have no more than 20 years, and probably realistically quite a lot less than 20 years, to make the decisions that would ensure that we follow the lower versus this higher pathway that we see in front of us. So it's really important to look at these as um, kind of like what the doctor tells you. You know, if you continue your current lifestyle, you're going to have all your arteries blocked in about 10 years kind of thing. Um, in the same way, when that happens to you, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to go for surgery. So in the same way here, if we end up um, on this higher pathway, um, and we're out at 2060 or 2070, it's looking like this. Well, at that point, it's too late to avoid those impacts because they're already going to happen because of what we've already done. And that's why this type of work, I think, is so important is because it gives us that future picture while we still have time to do something about it. So by the end of the century, human choices are the greatest source of uncertainty in temperature projections. Scientific uncertainty is still the greatest source of uncertainty in precipitation for most regions, including the southeast. Our global mean temperature is likely to increase between about 2 to 6 degrees Celsius, depending on our scenario. And if we're looking over this time scale, it's really important to use multiple scenarios covering a range from high to low. So for example, of the scenarios we just looked at, um, using the highest and the lowest scenario, and there's a new set of scenarios that are just coming out right now. The climate model projections are just becoming available, called RCP scenarios. And it's important to use a range of those too. In fact, let me go to, I think I have a slide at the end. Uh, yes, here we go. These are the scenarios we just looked at, the ones we've been using for the last 10 years. And these ones over here, are the new scenarios that have just been developed. And what you can see is actually there's, they're very parallel. So that one goes right to this one. These ones go right to this one. So the scenarios are very compatible with each other. It's not like they're introducing anything particularly new, except maybe the option of really trying to get our act together on climate and doing something. Um, so don't be discouraged by all the different acronyms that people are throwing at you. The most important thing, the bottom line here, is to make sure we cover a good range of future projections because we don't know what humans are going to do. And we need to cover that uncertainty. Let's see. Where are we here? Okay, good. I brought us back. All right. So part number five, and for anybody who's counting, we have six parts here. Uh, part number five is that we do have another uncertainty I haven't talked about before. And that is the uncertainty of trying to get our global models, and up here, this is a global model, trying to get our global model down to the scale that we actually live at, where we feel the impacts. So I'm going to offer a fifth source of uncertainty here to round out our list, and that is that global change affects each location and each region in a very unique way. It's kind of like the same germ it can affect different people in different ways. Your symptoms are slightly different. Some are more severe and some are less. Some of the actual symptoms are even different. One person might get a cough, another person gets a sore throat, another person gets headaches. Uh, so just as germs affect everybody differently, in the same way, global temperature change affects every region differently because of characteristics of that location. So what can we do about that? Well, this is where something called downscaling comes in. And downscaling is simply defined as trying to simulate what's going on 
below the scale of the global model. This is the global model right here. Trying to simulate what's going on below the scale of the global model from what's coming out of that model. And how we do that is um, through two different ways. One is using statistical models and the other is using regional climate models. Statistical models take observations into account and incorporate the observations into the global model simulations to get something that looks like this, which is very high resolution. Now, what is downscaling? Um, it might surprise you that downscaling is actually can be very, very simple. Let me show you an example. Um, the most simple type of downscaling is called the delta approach. And some of you might even have done this without knowing it. Um, all you need is to be able to add and subtract. That's the only math required. And what you simply do is you take the, say you're interested in how temperatures in April are going to change. So you calculate the average April temperatures historically, observed. Calculate the average April temperatures simulated by the climate model for the same time period, historically. Calculate average April temperatures simulated for whatever future period you're interested in. And then you take the future minus the historical model, and then you add that to your observations. And what it does is it takes the, um, it takes the historical distribution here, and it simply shifts the mean over like this. So if this is your April temperature, it simply shifts your April temperature into the future by the delta, or the actual change, projected by the climate model. Um, this is the most commonly used method of downscaling. Uh, people are using it today. Um, and it's actually a good choice if you're just interested in seasonal or annual mean temperatures because it gives you about the same result as a more complicated method. And it's really easy to do. It's not a black box. Um, and like I said, it just requires simple addition. Well, what if you're interested in more than just seasonal averages? What if you're interested in what's going on at the monthly scale? Well, then there's this approach that has been done and a database is available where you can download the stuff um, from the web, which is great. Uh, and the method it used is something we call quantile mapping, where it took the climate model, which is orange, and it took the observations, which here are blue. And for every quantile of the distribution, so like here, for 90th, it calculated the difference between the observations and the model. And then it did, uh, it did 91, and then it did 92, and so on, down the curve. You know, starting all the way over here and going up. So for every quantile, it calculated this, this factor that would basically map the orange curve onto the blue curve. And then it uses that factor to correct future projections. And this is at the monthly scale. And so it's a good choice if your impacts depend on time scales of months and, or weeks. Um, if they don't, then we have a new database that is just, I think, coming online called um, asynchronous regional regression. Don't worry about the statistical terms. But basically what it does is it cracks the whole daily distribution by month. So what you have here is you have two locations. One I think is, I think the first one's Alaska. I think this one here is Alaska. And then I think this other one here is California. Um, where the red is the climate model, the black is the observations, and the green is the downscaled. So in, for Alaska, the climate model does a pretty good job, and we just have to correct it a little bit. For California, the climate model was completely out to lunch, but even still, the downscaling did a really good job of bringing it back to where the observations were. So those are all statistical methods, but we also have regional climate models, which are basically like global models, except over a smaller area at a finer scale. They're very expensive to run, so it's not something you do yourself. But some groups have made their outputs available that you can get. And when you get it, um, why it's so good is because it takes the, the global model, this is the global model here, which, for example, has a, has a precipitation right there that's completely wrong. Not there at all. Look at the observations. No precipitation there at all. And the regional model does a pretty decent job of correcting it and moving that precipitation over to where it's supposed to be in the Midwest. Now, the regional models can still have biases in them relative to the observations, so sometimes they still require a delta downscaling in addition to the regional climate modeling. Um, they're also more limited.
in terms of what's available. They haven't used as many climate model inputs or as many scenarios. But the advantage of, of regional models is they don't just give you temperature and precipitation. They give you winds, humidity, soil moisture, cloudiness, solar radiation, all kinds of things like that. So depending on what you need, you might be getting it from a regional model versus a statistical model. It really depends on, on the variables that you need and the time scale that you're looking at. So I mentioned that future projections can be very sensitive to which method you're using. Um, here we have future projections for two cities. Um, and there's no observations here because it's, you know, it's 80 years in the future. Um, every colored line corresponds to the same climate model downscaled using a different method. So the only difference here is the downscaling method. It's the same climate model. It's the same location. It's just different downscaling methods. If you look in the middle here, they're very similar, right? However, if you look at the edges, they're very different. And so that's where the downscaling method matters is if you're looking at the extremes. So again, if you're looking at the average conditions, then even the simplest approach does a pretty respectable job, which is good. But if you're looking at the extremes, you have to be careful. And what we're looking at here is not um, uncertainty. So not, you know, you should use all of these methods because we don't know which one is right. With downscaling, it's very different. We know some of these. Like, for example, we know this, these two are not right because they don't resolve the daily values at all. So they shouldn't be used for this. So it's not a matter of uncertainty. It's a matter of they're just un inappropriate. Let me show you what I mean in a different way. Um, this is the same two locations. Uh, southeast, is, um, southeast is actually Atlanta, again, and Midwest is actually Chicago. There we go. Uh, and what this is, is accumulated degree days from different downscaling methods. Starting with more simple methods over here, it's simple, and then going to more complex methods over here. Complex. Okay. And what you see here is there's really no difference. Um, this is the accumulated degree days over, I think, April to October. So it's a long period of time. And there's no difference between the methods. But what if we're interested in days over 95 degrees, for example? Then there's a huge difference between the methods because this is at the tail of the distribution. So this is where you want to be really careful to use a method that actually resolves the tails of the distribution rather than a method like this, which does not and shouldn't be used for this. It's just inaccurate. And they'll give you a number that's really different. So, Bottom line for downstream, um, simple methods are surprisingly reliable, uh, but we need more complex methods to simulate changes in thresholds and extremes. Um, and even still, no method, not even the best regional model in the world, can successfully crack for biases in the global model for multi-day events because all of these downscaling approaches are fed by the global model, at least on a daily scale. So nearly any downscaling method is better than using the climate model output directly. But the ideal downscaling method for any analysis depends on what questions you're asking. Uh, so there is really no perfect method. It really depends on what you need and why you need it. But whatever you're doing, understanding the limitations of your methods can help not just to pick a method, but also to interpret it appropriately. So coming soon, actually let me change this here. Um, we have these downscale projections that are not at half degree, they're actually one eighth degree, um, and for individual weather stations. And then we also have a guidebook coming soon, I think this spring, that lays out a lot of the information I've just talked about in a lot more detail, um, talking about how you pick climate models, how you pick downscaling approaches, um, uh, where the different scenarios come from, and even providing a lot of examples of how they've been applied in the past. So part number six, um, translating the impacts. We cannot forget this part of it because you could do the best job in the world at getting the highest resolution projections in the world, but if you don't translate them into the information that's needed, they're useless. So the example here is um, on the top we have average winter temperature in the northeast, and in the bottom, we have number of days with 15 centimeters of snow on the ground or more where you can actually snowmobile. 
So the bottom graph immediately shows you what's going to happen to the snowmobile industry in the Northeast, whereas the top graph really tells you nothing about that. So let's just look at some examples because these are fun. This is where the fun stuff comes in. Um, this is something that we did for a number of Northeast states as well as for Midwest states. We said, what would a typical summer feel like under lower emissions or under higher emissions by the middle of the century or by the end of the century um, in terms of average temperature and humidity, the heat index, how hot would it feel? And so this is a way, for example, in Michigan to say, well, you know, all you have to do is go visit Missouri in the summer and you're going to have a sense of what your average summer is going to feel like in a few decades. And that's just a really helpful way for us to visualize um, what might happen. A study we did for Chicago was to look at the recurrence of a very specific heat wave that they had in 1995. Most people in Chicago alive today have, have lived through that heat wave, if they're older than 16 years old. Um, and so they know what it felt like. The city of Chicago knows how much it cost them. They know how many people died. They know how much energy was used. So what we did was we actually calculated how many of these heat waves you would expect to see under higher versus lower emissions in these uh, three future 30-year periods. And so by the time you get to the end of the century, what we see is you would have one of these heat waves every three years under lower emissions, and you could have as many as three a year under higher emissions. And so this is an event that they know what it feels like, and this is really staggering when you think of it recurring like that. Um, the National Arbor Day Foundation uh, redrew the USDA's plant hardiness zone maps in 2006, and then just last week, the USDA redrew its own plant hardiness zone maps, so actually, this should be updated now. I think they have a 2010 version. But what we did here is we took the actual definition used by the USDA, and we calculated uh, the changes that you would expect under lower versus higher emissions by the end of the century using the same definition of plant hardiness zone. Um, and what you see are some pretty massive shifts. I mean, um, for, for Chicago, for example, if you look at Chicago, which is right, uh, right here, you see it's already shifted significantly, and it would continue to change very substantially by the end of the century, um, which affects all the, the, the plants and the characteristics of a lot of the ecosystems you expect in that region. Um, you can use this information as input to climate envelope models, which we did here. This is a, a U.S. Forest Service climate envelope model um, that suggests where different trees would like to be if they could pick up and move, <laughs> theoretically, by the end of the century under higher emissions. So this really translates our temperature and precipitation information into something that we can understand that means something to us. Uh, another thing we did was we explored um, ranges for uh, cold intolerant um, uh, species. Um, this is a pest that is currently eating its way through all of the hemlock in the Northeast. And what this analysis showed is that the cold temperature thresholds that are currently limiting it to uh, to below, let's see, currently limiting it to below this area, are going to be expanding, allowing the hemlock woolly algae to to move up through the Northeast and even potentially into Canada over time. And so for for the um, southeast, let me just show you a couple of projections I have for the southeast. Um, what you're looking at here, you're looking at here nine pictures. And this, at the top, we have a uh, lower change. And then here we have moderate change. And here we have higher change. And then what we have over here along with the other axes are the range of climate models. So this is, let's see, this is a oops, less sensitive model. And then this one is most sensitive model. And then this one here in the middle is the average of all models. Does that make sense? I know this is a little bit confusing. And so if we go to the next, this might help. Okay. So this is the average change in fall precipitation. You can see that it gets wet pretty much everywhere. It gets wetter the farther, the greater the amount of change you have, and it's more consistent. Um, so again, let's see here. 
this here is the average projected change from all the climate models. And as we go further down, that's greater amount of global temperature change, not regional change, but global change. The interesting thing is to look at uh, extremes. Um, this is looking at the change in days per year over two inches of rain. Um, and what we see is a, is a big increase in these extremes that's likely driven by increased moisture transport up from the Gulf of Mexico. You can actually see it coming up if you look right here. You can see it coming up right there. It's coming up right from the Gulf of Mexico. And basically, the warmer the Gulf of Mexico gets, the stronger this effect becomes. So these are just some fun examples. And let me conclude with reminding you of our list, which now has five things on it, which is that there's five different reasons why future projections are uncertain. And there's actually probably a few more than this. But these are the five ones to keep in mind, because we've got natural factors, we've got human factors, we've got scientific factors. And we've got regional factors, and they all play into making these uncertain. But by understanding where these uncertainties come from, we can address them appropriately. We are not completely handicapped, you know, deer in the headlights, I don't know anything, I can't do anything. Not at all. There's a lot we can do because we understand where these uncertainties come from and what we can do about them. So bottom line, there are many sources of uncertainty. Which one is more important depends on the question you're asking. There's no perfect climate model, but most are useful. Any downscaling approach is better than none. And like I said at the end, even the best projections in the world cannot be used if you can't translate them into the terms that matter to what you're looking at. And that really is the bottom line. And that's it. Thank you very much.